Hey, Pastor Michael here. Uh, throughout this What Christians Believe uh, sermon series, there's been a couple times that have warranted um, me just doing a follow-up video to clarify some things from the Sunday sermon. And this Sunday is another one of those times when uh, a follow-up video is warranted. <clears throat> More than any sermon I've ever preached in nine years in this church, this message has got a lot of feedback. Mostly overwhelmingly positive feedback, but there's been definitely some disagreement too, and I expected that, and I'm totally okay with that. That's, that is, uh, that's a good thing. I, I would want you <clears throat> to push back if you weren't comfortable with it. So, so thank you for interacting with the message. Um, there have been a few questions that I think um, should, should, uh, should be addressed for, for, maybe you have some of these same questions and you haven't asked them, and, uh, and they're good questions. And I think some clarification will be helpful. So um, the first, so the sermon was for those who don't, uh, maybe didn't catch it. You should go back and listen to the sermon first. Otherwise, this isn't going to make any sense. So my sermon on Sunday was about hell, and about particularly about the nature of hell. And uh, I grew up believing that hell is eternal conscious torment. And and that view is that is that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior when you die, you are going to endlessly experience the suffering and punishment of hell without end. You want to die, but you won't be able to. Um, and this is called the traditional view because this is what most evangelical Christians have believed throughout the centuries. However, in, in recent years, my thinking has shifted as I've studied the scriptures and as I've listened to theologians towards a view that's called annihilationism, or conditional immortality. Uh, and, and that view is that, uh, is that uh, hell is not perpetual, that hell comes to an end. So let me explain that, because this is the first question that I want to, to answer. So some people have said, well, this sounds, uh, this sounds a whole lot like what my atheist friends believe, that, that when we die, we just cease to exist. And they say that that doesn't really sound like what the Bible says. Um, and, and and I say, you're right. The Bible doesn't just say that when you, we die, we just cease to exist. And that's not the annihilationist position. The annihilationist, annihilationist position agrees with the eternal conscious torment position to a point in that we do believe that if, you, if people die, sadly, without Christ, uh, in their sin, unforgiven sin, that <clears throat> they will experience a time of punishment. They will experience... A time of God's wrath being poured out justly on the sins that they have committed in their lifetime. The Bible talks about there being degrees of punishment, degrees of hell. And that's sort of what that's talking about, right? Is that there will be, um, you know, depending on the level of sin that you've committed, you know, a varying degree of suffering. <clears throat> the difference between, between annihilationism and eternal conscious torment is about the duration of that. The annihilationist position says that God's punishment will come to an end. The annihilationist position says that the fire, the consuming fire of God's wrath, will do what it, what fire does. It will destroy. It will consume. Uh, it will not just perpetually burn without consuming those who are in it. So, <clears throat> and whether that's literal or figurative language, the point is, is that the ultimate end of the time of suffering is destruction, as opposed to just perpetual suffering. So that's that's that view. And and when you think about, um, I mentioned you know my sermon about Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me just read that scripture. It's Second uh, Peter two six says, by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them. God God condemned them to extinction making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, 2 Peter 2.6. Okay, so when you think about Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah went through a terrible experience of God's wrath. Nobody who went through that would say that wasn't so bad. You know, people say, well, the annihilationist view makes hell seem not bad at all. You know, it's just, it's, it's no big deal, and, and how that's going to be really dangerous for the gospel. But if you, you know, people... You, if you were part of the Sodom and Gomorrah experience, you would not have said, "Hey, no big deal. It was it was terrible." And uh, and uh, but there was the the thing is is that Sodom and Gomorrah is not still burning today. Uh, it burned down, 
and it was reduced to ashes. And it says in Second Peter that God condemned them to extinction. And that is an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Another, another th way of thinking about that is about uh, Jesus' own substitutionary atonement. Uh, in a previous sermon, we talked all about views of the atonement. But one of the views that we hold is that Jesus' death was a substitutionary atonement for our sin. That means that he took our punishment on himself for our sins. So, so that when he went to the cross, what he suffered is what we should have suffered, the, the just penalty for sin, the consequence of our sin. So what did Jesus suffer? Jesus experienced a temporary experience of terrible anguish and pain and torture and suffering by the Romans. And then he died. Okay? A temporary experience of suffering and then death. That was the consequence that Jesus took for our sin upon himself. If, if the eternal conscious torment view is true, the traditional view, then it would make more sense that if Jesus took our punishment for our sin, that he would be suffering in hell for eternity. Because that would be, that is what the eternal conscious torment view says, is the just penalty for sin. Suffering for eternity in hell. Uh, but Jesus didn't do that. So, there's, not, there's some issues there with, uh, with our soteriology, our belief in salvation. Um, I would argue that Christ's death on the cross is a picture of the annihilationist view. A temporary period of suffering followed by death. And Jesus' death was a physical death, but in the end of the book of Revelation, it calls it our, this death, the lake of fire, it calls it the second death. Meaning it's even more than that, it's a spiritual death as well, an extinction. Uh, as, as it says, as Jesus said, or as, sorry, as, uh, yeah, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, such as the Romans, but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who is able, this is God, to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is what God is capable of doing. It doesn't say he will, but certainly implies that he will. And all the other scriptures certainly uh, lead, lean in that direction as well. So, is the annihilationist view the same as what an atheist believes, that when we die, we just that's the end, and, and our brains shut down, and therefore we cease to exist? No, that's not the annihilationist view. The annihilationist view is that there will be a time of conscious torment, uh, paying the just penalty for our sins, probably at varying degrees based on the sin that we've committed in, the, in our lifetime, but that the punishment will be successful. In a way, uh, it's not, it's like thinking about corporal punishment versus capital punishment, okay? So corporal punishment is, you know, could go on forever. Uh, but capital punishment has an end. Capital punishment leads to death. And, and, and so the, what the, I think that the biblical evidence points to is that hell, the end of the wicked in, at the end of time when all is said and done, is eternal capital punishment, not eternal corporal punishment. Okay, so that's the first uh, big thing that I wanted to clarify because I don't think I made that as clear in my sermon as I should have. I certainly mentioned the, that perspective, but I didn't make it super clear and, and I didn't want to cause confusion about that. So there's that. The other thing is, is that some people have said, this is a new idea, that, that this is a new, this is new, um, uh, this is not the traditional belief of the church, and therefore it should be rejected on those grounds. And that's a good point, because I, I also very strongly believe that, that we should lean towards believing what is orthodox, meaning what it has been the accepted belief of the church for, uh, for the longest time. Uh, however, that being said, the church is fallible. Humans make mistakes. We should go follow the biblical evidence wherever it leads. But also, very key point here is that annihilationism or conditional immortality is not a new view. It has roots way back in the early church. So, um, the early church fathers uh, held this view, such as Justin Martyr. He died in the year 165. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch uh, had uh, views that indicated that he believed in conditional immortality or annihilationism. He died the year 107. These are early church fathers. 
uh, Arnobius the, died the year 330, uh, and there are others. Even the reformer Martin Luther. So we think about, you know, the reform guys. They all certainly believed, we, we think, all believed that, you know, everyone suffers for eternity in hell. Um, but Martin Luther argued that the soul is not immortal. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, these, these are not new ideas. They're just not the mainstream. They're just not the main popular idea that the church embraced. They're just, uh, they're not new. They're just um, different than what we, most of us have been taught. Um, and some people have also said, well, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists believe. So we don't want to be grouped in with them. I mean, their beliefs are weird, right? Well, first of all, the ev evangelical biblical view of annihilationism is not exactly the same as Seventh Day Adventist, the Seventh Day Adventist position, or the Jehovah's Witness position. It's certainly similar, um, but we can't use the guilty by association argument uh, because this, because then I could just throw that back and say, well, look, Muslims believe in eternal conscious torment. So, do you want to be grouped in with the Muslims? I don't think so. So that's not a good argument. So just throw that one out. Um, another thing that um, people might be feeling is that it, it's uh, inappropriate or unbaptist or dangerous to talk about these things. And uh, and and that uh, it may even be sort of heresy to talk about these things. It's, it's, it's wrong. That this is, this is horrible. And uh, I would say that if you hold that view, you need to take a look at, um, at what a lot of really well-respected evangelical scholars and pastors are saying because even if they don't agree with the view, they do believe that it is well within the evangelical camp and the biblical camp to hold the view. J.I. Packer, for example, who is not a, not a conditionalist, he, he believes in eternal conscious torment, he says that uh, conditionalists are honored fellow evangelicals. That's pretty good. Um, and uh, I actually have a list here of all of the well-respected evangelical Bible scholars who do believe in uh, annihilationism or conditional immortality, as I do. Uh, we've got Basil Atkinson, Richard Bauckham, E. Earl Ellis, Roger Forster, R.T. France, Michael Green, Harold Gilbert, I don't know how to say his name, uh, P.E. Hughes, David Inst Instone Brewer, Dale Moody, I. Howard Marshall, well-known name, John Stackhouse, who teaches at Crandall University in Moncton, as I mentioned in my sermon. Uh, he's part of our own Baptist family here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, John Stott, very well-respected theologian, author. Richard Swinburne, Anthony Thistleton, Terence Thiessen, Stephen Travis, John Wenham, Nigel Wright, uh, and the list goes on. And our own, uh, our own sem seminary, Acadia Divinity College, has professors who hold to annihilationism, so our pastors are being trained under people who hold this view. So it's very hard to say that it's, uh, that it's uh, heresy or outside of the camp of what is uh, biblical or evangelical when, um, when, we're training, when, when we're, we are training our pastors at Crandall and Acadia and even their, their professors, their faculty, uh, some of them at least, hold this view. So um, I was really encouraged by what uh, Sam Chase said. Uh, Sam Chase it was the uh, executive director, or the uh, general secretary of Canadian Baptist Ministries, which was the, uh, which is the overarching group that ties all Canadian Baptists together across Canada. And uh, and he just said thank you. He he watched my sermon. He said thank you for this. He said uh, even if you know wherever one lands on the on the fi in in the end, if you don't agree, if you do agree, just the fact that we're having the conversation is healthy and positive and people are thinking about it, and we need to be talking about it. So, um, if you feel that it was inappropriate, um, I lovingly disagree with you, um, and, and I just continue to encourage you um, to, to uh, study it for yourself. I, 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 I said that in my sermon. Don't take my word for it, okay? Uh, research this for yourself. I, I would be disappointed, actually, if you, your whole view changed uh, based on hearing one sermon. Uh, that's not good to be that easily swayed, right? Study the scriptures for yourself, do the research, um, and, and if you want to have some resources, you want me to help you point you to some things to look at, I can do that. Obviously, I'm biased because I, I have, I'm pretty fully convinced of this view, um, but I would, I would certainly love to have a chat with you, and if you disagree, that's absolutely okay too. 
this is not our church's position. This is, uh, this is a position that I have come to through study, uh, and certainly there may be others in the church who disagree with me, and it's absolutely not a problem. Uh, we, can, we can agree to disagree and still s strive side by side for the sake of the gospel. So God bless you. I hope that this was helpful to you. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, certainly continue to ask them. Uh, if I feel like there are uh, questions that other people might have too or multiple people are asking, I might do another video just to address those things. But hope this was helpful to you. I'm sorry it was 15 minutes. I was hoping it would be more like five. So, But thanks for your time. Okay, this Sunday the sermon is about, uh, about the second coming of Christ. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy about that too, but we're not going get to gonna get into all the controversial stuff. I, this Sunday's message is going to be really encouraging, uh, uh, but the hope of, that we have in heaven, so through Christ. So come, and uh, we look forward to seeing you this week at Perth Andover Baptist Church. God bless.